Israel says its troops have entered southern Gaza's largest city. The military says its forces have reached the centre of Han Yunus, with other soldiers surrounding it. Israeli commanders say their troops are engaged in some of the most intense fighting so far. Israel says its aim is to eliminate Hamas. Hundreds of thousands of people have been told to evacuate to humanitarian zones, but the UN says nowhere in Gaza is safe. Survivors sift through the rubble of a destroyed home, struck by Israeli missiles in the early hours of the morning. There were 30 people inside the house, 20 of them were children. We don't know what happened to us. The fire hit and all of it collapsed on top of us. None of us made it out completely okay. Everyone is hurt. The United Nations says almost 1.9 million Gazans have fled their homes since the war began. Many wound up here in Han Yunus. Now, Gaza's second largest city is a battleground. Israel says it is operating against Hamas strongholds in the south and both sides report that the fighting is fierce, leaving civilians with nowhere to go. All my senior colleagues have been very clear, including the Secretary General, saying there, is no, there, is no, there are no safe places in Gaza. The main hospital in Han Yunus is overwhelmed. The UN says delivering vital aid supplies is impossible amid the fighting. And still, the injured keep coming, as do the bodies. The devastation in Han Yunus has left many Palestinians with a sense that the world has abandoned them. We need someone to stand by our side. We need someone to find us a solution. We are devastated. But despite a brief ceasefire between Israel and Hamas, the renewed fighting is as intense as ever. Lynn Hastings is the United Nations humanitarian coordinator for the Palestinian territories. With Israel pushing its offensive further south and so many civilians there whom they expect to move again, I asked if that is reasonable. No, and I think we've been very, very clear on that. There is really no safe place to go in Gaza. Currently, the offensive in Khan Yunis is pushing people further to the southeast into a very, very, very small portion of Gaza. Um, of course, this is presenting real problems for us in terms of just logistically moving around with such a packed population in such a small area. Humanitarian groups have time and again criticised these so-called safe zones as not being sufficient. Is there some way the UN uh, could or should assist in setting up these safe zones? Yeah. Again, we've been very clear uh, to the extent that all of the executive directors of humanitarian agencies have indicated that we will not participate in the establishment of safe zones unless very, very specific conditions are met. The first of those, of course, is there actually has to be an agreement between warring parties. The UN, unfortunately, has experience in what are called safe zones. And, of course, our determination has been that they are, in fact, not safe zones. In addition to there needing to be an agreement, people need to be able to move in and out freely. In addition, the United Nations and its humanitarian partners must be able to deliver to people who are not in the safe zone. We need to be able to deliver to communities that are hosting IDPs. Some families are hosting maybe 60 people in their own homes. That's not necessarily in the safe zone. So again, we will not participate in the establishment of safe zones unless specific conditions are met. So the zones obviously need to be safe, not just for the civilians, but your people too. Uh, do Tell us about the conditions right now in Han Yunus, which is coming under heavy bombardment and fighting. Yes, so it's exactly as you say, it's heavy bombardment. We have reports from some of our own staff who are in these so-called deconflicted boxes. The government of Israel issued a map over the past couple of days indicating which areas might be hit and which not. But even those people who are living, trying to live in the uh, zones that have been indicated to be safe are also coming under fire. And that's why everybody's moving into ever smaller uh, parts of Gaza. And of course, I'm sure your listeners um, can understand that the more people that are pushed into small, small spaces without proper hygiene, sanitation, 
access to water, access to food. It's really just a public health crisis unfolding. What sort of possibility is there at the moment of getting more food and medicine in to uh, help those people? Yeah. So um, there's been a lot of activity, obviously, on social media lately. And there is one hashtag that the government of Israel has put out, which is basically saying hashtag uh, United Nations to keep up. I just want to make it very clear to everybody that the United Nations continues to define Israel as the occupying power. They have control over the sea, land, and air space. Um, this makes them the occupying power. This actually means that they are responsible to ensure that we can deliver. Um, and in fact, they are responsible for providing assistance to people who are in need. Uh, so I wanted to make that very clear um, as we have to the government of Israel, and in addition to that, that we need commercial trucks and openings to start again. Right now, we are being asked to deliver humanitarian assistance, bringing in very, very large trucks with all of our commodities through what is a pedestrian crossing. We need the commercial crossings to be reopened. Nowhere in the world does the United Nations support an entire population. We always work with partners. That includes public sector and the commercial sectors. One of those uh, commercial crossings you're talking about is in the south, controlled uh, by Israel in this case, uh, unlike the Rafah crossing. But there are also Israeli soldiers stationed there. So, uh, I, I mean, it, it sounds like an impossibility. In fact, today, the government of Israel informed us that we would be able to use that crossing for verification, or rather, I should say, they would be able to use that crossing for verification, because currently the Israelis are verifying uh, what's inside of trucks, inspecting basically what side, what's inside of trucks to make sure that they, um, the commodities can go in safely in line with the government of Israel or the Israelis' uh, security needs. So now that's going to be moved up from about an hour and a half south of Gaza, and we will be able to start using that crossing, as I say, the Israelis will be doing their verification processes there, and then we will be moving the trucks around the corner, so to speak, uh, and through Rafa, which and is, any... sorry, it's in Egypt. Sure. Yes. A any more breakthroughs when it comes to, uh, or any progress at all, when it comes to delivering by sea? Uh, I know Cyprus had been in talks and had been pushing for a, a, a corridor, a humanitarian corridor via the sea. Yeah, so those talks are ongoing. Um, we haven't seen anything solidified yet. Uh, from the United Nations perspective, we will continue to pursue the reopening of commercial crossings and crossings so that we are able to bring the trucks in on a very, very regular basis. But I do also, again, just want to emphasize it's not just about getting things into Gaza. It's about what's happening inside of Gaza that makes it absolutely impossible for us to properly to deliver. There are not the conditions right now for the United Nations and its partners inside of Gaza to be delivering humanitarian assistance at the scale that is needed. But Lynn, is that the main or only reason why these talks are going on and on and on? I mean, we're, we're talking about more than 60 days of war now. Yeah, and so that's obviously another thing. Humanitarian assistance is a Band-Aid. Um, again, we're not supposed to support the entire population. What we need is a ceasefire a release of all the hostages, and then ultimately a political solution. That seems very, very far away right now, but it is up to the parties to be able to find a political solution so we can put an end to this. Is there any more that the international community can do to aid civilians, uh, to bring about some sort of restraint uh, when it comes to not only uh, uh, what's going on there in Gaza and what Hamas is doing, but also what Israel is doing. Yeah. So I have highlighted, of course, what some of our obligations are, including Israel, but all member states do have an obligation. They need to be able to be speaking to the warring parties to try and come to some sort of solution. Um, so each of us have an obligation, and right now not many of those obligations are being filled. 
right now, it's a bit too early, I guess, to be talking about this, but at some stage uh, we will have to when fighting comes to an end. What sort of role do you see for the United Nations in post-war Ghana? Yeah, there are so many opinions right now, and we see various officials from the government of Israel, some from the Palestinian Authority, some from various member states, etc. So I'm not going to be able to pronounce on that one right now. We'll have to see how that works. Lynn Hastings, the UN's humanitarian coordinator for the Palestinian territories there.